I am a human rights activist uh, fighting for the elimination of child labor and forced labor. Uh, I used to be a journalist and a political consultant. I've had the immense privilege of uh, working in the centers of power of North America, Europe, and Asia. Um, I have worked for little countries like India and very poor countries like Norway. And I was dealing with the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, meaning the biggest companies in the world, uh, at the World Economic Forum, for example. And um, as you, I can say that I've had a privileged life uh, because my father was actually a, a prominent journalist and a politician. Uh, unfortunately, he was too prominent, so he was kidnapped when I was five. And that really changed my life because when your father gets kidnapped, everything changes. And then you see that your father was really important but also you understand how vulnerable you can be and your father can be and how things are so different. But um, I must start by confessing that like many people in the world or perhaps like most people in the world, I have been indifferent most of my life. Yes, I am now 61 and uh, it wasn't until uh, I turned basically uh, 52 that I realized that I had to do something else with my skills, tools, and contacts. Yeah, because I had a unique education. I was trained and not so far away from the White House, uh, thanks to somebody who actually worked inside the White House for the President of the United States. And also, um, I had the opportunity to work people with people who were working for the then candidate, Jacques Chirac, who became President of France. And in many other places, I've learned a lot of things. But I wasn't really thinking about how I could use this uh, to the benefit even of the poorest children in my own country. And this is just the way it is. And today we're going to talk about a teacher whose name was Louis Hein. I don't know how many of you have heard about Louis Hein. Anyone? Okay. Um, don't worry, uh, not even in the United States, the teachers have heard about Louis Hein. But uh, Louis Hein, perhaps, is one of the most influential teachers in the history of the United States, and I would say in the history of the world, because Mr. Hein, as a teacher, decided to become a sociologist. So he went to university, and he had a degree, and he started to understand society, and then he went uh, with a little camera and started photographing the migrants that arrived then in Ellis Island, and I'm talking more than 110 years ago now, and he then, started thinking that photography was actually a really serious tool for change. And in photography, Mr. Hein is known as not only a photographer, sociologist, and teacher, but he's also the father of social photography and the creator of what everybody calls today a photo story. Of course, there are photo stories in Vogue also, and in Elle, <laughs> but uh, Mr. Hein was thinking about how can you tell a story without any words, just showing pictures, or with very few words. And so Mr. Hein, in 1908, became the photographer for the National Child Labor Committee, and he stopped teaching. Between 1908 and 1924, Hein took more than 5,000 photos. Actually, 5,000 photos have been archived. Uh, I believe that he took about 15,000, but 5,000 are archived, and the US Congress, the library of the US Congress has most of them, actually, and his work uh, documenting child labor in the United States 110 years ago, was able to create such a discussion that actually pushed for the passage of the first child labor laws in the United States. And he introduced photography as a really powerful tool for social change. Uh, these are some of the photos that Mr. Hein took traveling around the country. And if you see these children they are a lot younger than you. Uh, some of them are six, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And these children were working in mines, for example, in factories. Uh, others were actually uh, uh, opening oysters with very sharp knives. But uh, Mr. Hein did an amazing job uh, trying to get into these places of work. Because, of course, the owner of the factory didn't want the photographer to come in. And in those days, the cameras were a big box. Yes, so Mr. Hein couldn't just bring in his smartphone. 
he had to bring a box. So he lied, yes, he lied, and uh, he told him, look, I would like to photograph your machinery because I think your machinery is amazing, but we will put some children here because then you can see the machinery size. And so he was able to convince them. And then uh, he pretended to be selling Bibles and he pretended many things just to get inside the places of work. And when he couldn't get inside, then he stood outside and photographed the children going into work and coming out of work and talked to them. And Ms. Work, uh, Mr. Hines' work was often dangerous. Uh, he referred to his work as detective work. And it was, because what he was doing um, was actually provoking violent reactions from the owners of these factories or the managers. And he had problems even with the police. Why? Because in those days, who owned the business was doing good, and the other guy who was trying to document that he was exploiting children uh, was doing bad. But anyway, uh, it's not different today, but here's Mr. Hein. And of course, photography was not only prohibited, but it was a really serious threat for the industry. And this was uh, from 1908 to 1924, but it is not different today. I'm working in something exactly like this. A hundred and some years, or well, a century after Mr. Hein almost finished, because he finished in 1924, uh, we are doing exactly the same. I'm working with photographers and investigative journalists in different countries uh, documenting child labor. And that's what I'm going to tell you a little bit later. But here you can see that Mr. Hein was talking about being a fire inspector, a postcard vendor, a Bible salesman, and industrial photography trying to document the record machinery. When Mr. Hein was doing this, uh, basically a century ago, there were two million children working in the United States. Now, things have changed. There's only one million children working in the United States, but there are tens of millions of children working for the United States because the supply chain of the United States is global. So if you buy an Apple phone inside the United States or anywhere in the world, many of the parts come from different countries. And of course they use minerals like cobalt, which come from Congo, usually, or most of it. And then there's child labor in cobalt, but there's child labor in many things. There's child labor in brands like Apple, as I said before, the smartphones, but there's child labor in Thar. And in the, between there's child labor in diamonds and in gold. And of course, in all the luxury brands. Uh, Gucci, Dior, Louis Vuitton, uh, yes, they use leather. And if you go to the countries where they buy this leather, uh, Bangladesh or India, uh, the people processing the leather are not only extremely poor, but some of them are as old as eight, nine, 10, 12, and they're not going to school. So this is unacceptable and cruel. And if you see here <coughs> these pictures uh, by other photographers in the last uh, 30 years, there's child labor everywhere, but the problem it's not only that there's child labor everywhere, the problem is that some countries that claim to be ethical and respectful of human rights and rule of law and all of the conventions, like Norway, I have worked for Norway, uh, I resigned also, but that's another story. Uh, Norway is today the largest single investor in the world. They have $1.3 trillion in assets under management. They should have 1.4, but they lost a little bit in the last year. Uh, but anyway, the largest investor in the world is a shareholder in 9,338 companies. Yes. So if you think, okay, are they a shareholder in Apple? Yes. Are they a shareholder in Inditex, which owns Sara? Yes. Are they a shareholder in Nestle? Yes. So Norway has, for example, uh, a little less than 3% of the shares of Nestle, and that's about $9 billion. Not bad. Yeah, 3% of Nestle is $9 billion because the company market capitalization is about 300 billion. So um, this is a cartoon by one of our cartoonists because I work with many cartoonists from around the world. Uh, his name is Martin Blotain. And this is a cartoon saying that Norway, one of the richest countries on earth, profits from the exploitation of tens of millions of children. And this is my statement, not Mr. Bontering's. And this is the prime minister of Norway, and this is me. And I'm telling the prime minister, not only in a cartoon, but also in writing, uh, that it's unacceptable that they do this because it's against the law of Norway, besides being illegal internationally. But that's, 
complicated, but to make it simple, I have been fighting with the prime ministers of Norway uh, since a few years because I also was fighting with the previous prime minister because it's unacceptable and cruel and of course illegal that a nation invest in corporations that profit from slavery and children because in the end it is the nation, meaning all citizens via the Central Bank of Norway, Norges Bank, that profit from slavery and child labor. And this is absolutely unacceptable and illegal. So Switzerland, which is another country that a lot of people think is a wonderful democracy, has more children working in the supply chains of coffee, tea and cocoa alone than children studying in all Swiss cantons. This is also incredible because people say, oh, Switzerland is a democracy, an exemplary democracy. Well, if we scratch under the surface and we start looking at the business model of Switzerland and at the Swiss companies there, we find a lot of things which are absolutely cruel. And we are working now on documenting child labor in the supply chain of Swiss companies and organizations. Uh, most of you know Starbucks, if not all, but very few know that Starbucks is actually based in Lausanne, Switzerland. Yes, worldwide for coffee buying and uh, tea and cocoa, Starbucks trading is based in Lausanne. Of course, when Starbucks trading buys coffee, usually 75% less than the real value of producing the coffee, that's the price paid by most coffee companies, then the farmers are poor, there is hunger, malnutrition, child labor, and even forced migration. And this has been even published in the front page of the Washington Post. Uh, and of course, it's a problem of governance inside the company, but also in the country. If uh, Switzerland was a bit more respectful of human rights, Switzerland would actually target every company in Switzerland that has business models that exploit children. They don't. Uh, this is one of the children that are harvesting cocoa. Uh, the cocoa industry admits now, because there's a study by the University of Chicago, uh, that there are still 1.56 million children working only in cocoa in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. These are not all the children that work for the cocoa industry because they have other hundreds of thousands of children working in other countries. Um, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana are a little bit less than 70% of all cocoa production. But there's also child labor in sugar, and there's child labor in hazelnuts, and there's child labor in palm oil, and now they found child labor in uh, powdered milk for Ben and Jerry's. And of course, all of these ingredients go into producing a chocolate. So the problem is widespread. But the biggest problem uh, is that people are not even talking about the size of the problem. Uh, UNICEF and the ILO say that there are 160 million children working worldwide. I have been saying since five years or six that there are at least 300 million. I have been called a liar, I guess, almost everywhere. So of course, in the companies, uh, by UNICEF and the ILO, even the Secretary General of the UN disagree with me. But uh, now there's a study by the University of, Chicago, uh, of uh, Pennsylvania and Zurich uh, by two academics that says that my numbers are too conservative and too low. Yes, 375 million children are working around the world according to this study. I have been in a discussion with governments like Mexico and Brazil because their numbers of child labor are too low. And this study says now that the numbers of Brazil are so low that the real number is seven times what UNICEF and the ILO have published. Seven times. That means that the number of children not even considered as part of the problem are counted. We cannot fix a problem if we don't know how big it is, where it is, and of course, if we don't attack the root causes, which is actually the business model of the companies. So I have been saying this, and in the international year for the elimination of child labor, which was officially adopted uh, at the United Nations Assembly General uh, with the vote of all members, um, as a majority, I, I don't know exactly how many voted in favor, but it was uh, almost all of them. Uh, we had this resolution. 2021 will be the international year for the elimination of child labor. Sadly, not one single member state had a plan to eliminate child labor. Not one. Wow. Of course, <laughs> this can continue like this. This has to change. And uh, this is a... Um, cartoon that you have seen before because I wear it. Uh, I'm very honored to say that also 
the president of the European Parliament, Roberta Menzola, and many others have accepted to wear it and to commit to zero tolerance to child labor. But this is a slave girl which is being liberated by education. Because everybody wants to talk about human rights, and of course, everybody wants to be cool and in favor of women's rights, uh, but very few are actually thinking about the little girls that work for all of us, millions of them. Yeah, well, we have to liberate all these girls, not only by not having them work for us, but by making sure that all of them have the right to education. I don't care if it's uh, in Italy or Spain or in Guatemala, where I come from, or in the United States, but all of these girls have to be hired. No, they have to be fired. Yes, these girls have to be fired and sent to school. And what we have to do is replace all of these children by adults. And to put things in perspective, uh, there is a very important and powerful a business group called the World Economic Forum, which meets in Davos since 53 years, and they claim that they are improving the state of the world, but only there, in these 2,500 participants of the WEF, they have more than 75 million children working for them. They don't like that I go there and say that, but they almost can't keep me out anymore because I have been around for 14 years in those and meetings. But you know, it's absolutely unacceptable that the media doesn't say that there are 75 million children working in the supply chains of 2,500 web participants. But the world is like this. There is indifference. I have been indifferent, as I said before. But most importantly, very few people are doing what is needed to fix this. Uh, this is uh, one of our first cartoons for change. Um, which is an initiative that I started as an act of desperation because I needed help to get the message across newspapers all over the world. So I invited cartoonists from all over the world to join me and defending children's rights. And this was done by Antonio Rodriguez, who's a very famous cartoonist in Mexico. And of course, I don't need to tell you the brand, but this is a child working for one of the most successful companies ever. Well. It's not necessary that they exploit children, but they don't want to change the business model. They don't want to change the business model in the purchase of raw materials. Well, they have to. Why? First of all, because it's illegal. And second, because soon more and more shareholders, which means the owners of the company, are going to start complaining. And that's what I'm working on. I'm working on getting the shareholders of the companies to complain to their own executives that their policies are actually not defending human rights, children's rights, and are actually violating many laws, including investor fraud. Yes, because they tell the investors they're doing something and they're actually not. And this is a company that I'm sure all of you recognize. I call it Magmissary because the growers of coffee, tea, cocoa, sugar, and many other products actually live in misery. Even if this is the single largest a restaurant chain in the world, or cafeteria chain, depending how you want to call it. And they have a partner, which I'm sure you recognize. I call them the Deforestation Alliance. Because this so-called certification has helped McDonald's and many other companies, including Espresso and others, uh, pretend that they are good while they are actually destroying the forest and increasing misery, hunger, malnutrition in their supply chains. This has to change. And this is another company that a lot of people think is very good. I, I actually uh, think the flavor of their ice cream is very good, but that's <laughs> different. Uh, the CEO of not this company, but the one that owns it is called Alan Job. I also met Alan a few times. Um, and this is one of the few CEOs, CEOs that has actually kicked me out of a meeting in Davos. But I don't take it personally, I understand that his job is to protect the company, and I, my job is to protect the children. Well, this company, of course, uses cocoa, sugar, powdered milk, according to the New York Times now, uh, with child labor. Uh, of course, they use many other ingredients like palm oil, and all of them have child labor, and they call themselves fair trade. Well, what is interesting is that fair trade has never, ever, ever paid the growers a fair price for their product. It's usually uh, now 
about 70% less than the real value of cocoa or sugar or coffee or tea or anybody that they call fair trade. I actually had to apologize once to the CEO of Unilever because I told him that he had women working for 50 cents a day in Sri Lanka. Well, Reuters, a very important news service, went to Sri Lanka and investigated this and they came back proving that I was wrong. Yes, the women were supposed to receive 50 cents, but they were actually only paid 14 cents because 36 cents of this fair trade business model were taken away for their food. Yeah. And this is the irony of the anti-child labor and anti-slavery campaigns. Yes, many of the campaigns of anti-child labor and anti-slavery are actually produced by child slaves. Yeah. It's just the way it is because in the fashion industry it's very difficult to find products which are not produced in an exploitative way. Well, you can make it yourself. Um, this is a little company that everybody knows. And you know, <laughs> this company is mostly uh, the responsibility of a family that created this company, which is admirable because they started in a very modest way in Spain. But now what is not admirable is that they not only have hundreds of thousands of children working all over the world, but maybe more than a million. And they also have millions of women in their supply chains and they are mostly extremely poor. Well, if we change the price of a product at Sara, Primark, H&M or CNA by one euro, uh, there would be no misery, no poverty and no child labor in their supply chains. Of course, we also have to think about the environmental impact of some of the raw materials used to produce this. And we also have to think about the microplastics and other things which are in our clothes, but we can talk about that another day. Um, this is a cartoon by a wonderful cartoonist from France. His name is Alf. And this is about fair trade and the European Union business model um, with Africa, Latin America nation. Basically, you can see here a very wealthy European Union, which actually makes a lot of money. And the business model is very simple. If you use more children, you will earn more because that's the way it works. So if you go to the supply chain of fair trade, you will find lots of children. Uh, the Washington Post published that certified cocoa had more child labor than non-certified. Why? Because they mostly work with the poorest families. Uh, this is a wonderful cartoon by Gilmar from Brazil. And you can see here, may the Lord have mercy on those who depend on your slave labor. Well, Brazil is one of the largest exporters of many products, is the largest exporter of coffee, and of course they produce sugar and soybeans and many other things, but unfortunately, many of the products exported by Brazil uh, to Europe are produced with forced labor or child labor or both. And uh, this is the real business model of these guys who actually just make children work so they can get more money. I have, uh, a little video to show you if we have time. 